was the first time that we're back on this indoor stage again in like four months, mm -hmm. and it was the first time that we were playing with James again in like two or three months after he was just singing. Mm -hmm. So the first, yeah, <laughs> the first couple of uh, shows, we did one show in Belgium before we came and played Wembley, so we're still getting kind of used to it again, but it's really, it picked up really well. Both of the Wembley shows were um, a lot better. You know, Wembley's notorious for, you know, the kids are standing mm -hmm. there going, okay, impress mm -hmm. us, you know, but actually we got, we got a lot of energy back from the kids at Wembley, a lot more than we'd expected from mm -hmm. when we played there the previous time. Mm -hmm. And also from everybody else came and said that they'd never seen a reaction like that at the Wembley show. So mm -hmm. we were really, really, really happy with it. And Birmingham tonight is the last show, and, and we got a couple of surprises and a few things we're going to try mm -hmm. and work in tonight. <laughs> a routine for warming up for a concert. How do you all get, get ready to, to perform? I think um, James, Kirk and I all do stretches uh, for about like a half an hour aerobics. You know, just full, <laughs> just full on serious stretches we've learned through different trainers and different stuff as we've run along and from each other. And uh, James and I both uh, warm up uh, from a vocal tape, you know, all that stuff, uh, sometimes over humidifier. Okay, I think it's steam going. Mm -hmm. So that usually takes place about uh, 35 or 40 minutes before we're actually onto the stage. Mm -hmm. Power bars. Power bars. Um, this, it's like a candy bar, but a little bit chewier mm -hmm. and a little, a little bit, bit more, a little bit thicker. More you know? cardboard yeah. flavored. <laughs> yeah. But it's got all this protein and uh, carbohydrates and everything in just this bar. And you right. take it with a bottle of water and it's like... <laughs> First, I just got to say that that's probably in the last year. That's probably the question I've been asked the most. What the hell is, is the Unforgiven about the video? But the song is basically about a guy who is in a in a situation where he goes through life without really ever making any decisions for himself. Right. He's always kind of being 
told what to do, always being guided and so on, and about how just at the end he kind of just dies off and realizes that he never really did anything for himself through through um through his life. The video is um what the hell is the video? About? Well, I think it signifies that <laughs> because it yeah. basically goes into like a yeah the video is about yeah the video is about this guy who's a little bit in a similar situation. He's like being tormented all through mm -hmm. his life, as you see in the beginning. Then he kind of goes and hides in the sewer system mm -hmm. and basically grows old mm -hmm. and goes through, you know, everything in the sewer system and basically mm -hmm. lives his life and then, and then right. at the end, very sad, just kind of so lays very, down and dies away. Well, James, as we had said earlier, is not feeling very well, Why? so uh, we were saying goodbye to James. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lars here, everybody else here. Show. So, um, Lars, can we ask you a few more questions sent in by viewers? Is that alright? I want to answer the other guys, the ones that were sent in for the other guys. Do you? Oh, cool. <laughs> do you like giving guitar lessons? Do you feel like you're a guitar hero? Absolutely. <laughs> why are you? I why, do this thing. I do this where I play guitar with my butt. Okay, okay, yes, I can tell that you're getting close to gig time. Let me introduce you to Big Mick. This is Metallica's sound man. And uh, how long have you been with Metallica? Too long. Uh, about eight years. Just having dinner, by the way. Some friends of mine. You like to introduce yourself, guys? These are all the trucking core. How many people are on the tour? Um, you I know, working we, behind uh, the scenes. Uh, we have about fifty crew, I believe. Fifty crew. Yeah. Plus, yeah. plus these uh, scummy type truck drivers here, which of course they'll kill me later for. Now, from your point of view, how difficult is it to do the sound with this new um, diamond-shaped stage? Does it pose any more difficult problems? Slightly. I mean, the, the fact that you have people everywhere. And you have to cover it all around the place. Oh, oh that was a bean. Did you see that then? A little bit of bean came over from the trucking car the other side of the room. Um, as to the sound problem, not a real problem. We kind of dealt with it in the early days, so we're sort of cruising along quite comfortably now. All right, we're heading up to the famous snake pit now. And this is actually uh, the diamond in the centre of the stage. Um, so how many people can fit in here? Uh, well, it varies, but for the UK and Europe, basically 85 people. 85? Uh -huh. Just because of the health and the fire rules here in Europe, they're a bit more stricter than America. So what's the sound like when you're actually in the middle of the stage? You can see hanging above us here, we've got two monitors here which give a complete mix of what's going on out front. And there's a small monitor here to see what's going on in the video screens out front. So how did you get into the snake pit? Oh, uh, friends, friends. Friends of friends, there you go, that's how you get in there. The idea came together pretty quick. As soon as we realised we wanted to do something that was not the normal configuration, mm -hmm. then it was like, okay, well, here you go, and then everybody can run around, and James can have mics all over the place, mm -hmm. and we'll have a couple of kits that move around, and blah, 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 and okay, off we go. And then the major revelation that came, that was the last thing that happened, was this thing about we had this big dead space in the middle of the mm -hmm. stage, because we realized we would always be playing out to, you know, where right. obviously where the, the kits were and so on, so it was like, well, the stage is so big, what's going to go on in the middle of the stage? Well, maybe we'll have like a prop or an inflatable statue or a big cross come up and something highly original like that. And then I was like, well, maybe we'll leave that to the other heavy metal band. <laughs> and then uh, Mensch came up with this idea, why don't we just basically put people in there? It's like, yeah, okay, Peter, go lie down and we'll be fine. But then we realized, it's like, wait a minute, maybe we could actually put people in. And then we like basically cut like a big piece of the stage out in the middle and they put a platform in there. And now there's about 150 people in there that have a very unique uh, view yeah. of Metallica. Yeah. I'm going to show you something which we're probably not allowed to show you, but the whole of the um, ceiling is plastered with pictures of um, scantily clad young ladies. It says tuning and attitude, and uh, that's exactly what is going on backstage. There's uh, Kirk, he's warming up for tonight's show, and we are not going to uh, interrupt him because uh, I think we're going to go and find Lars again. And uh, if we go in here, if you'd like to follow me, Lars is actually working out the uh, set list for tonight's show, and we're following him around the whole day, and uh, it's getting a bit much now, isn't it? Um, do you change the set sort of nearly every night um, then? Well, what we do is uh, look, look at the Metallica set list. Um, 
what we try to do is this is our second night in Bur Birmingham, <laughs> and um, we went over. We do we have like kind of an A set that's the main feel we feel is the best set. So we play that on all the places where we have just one night. But all the places where we have two shows, we always try and change it around the second night. But we're trying to move some things around here that's giving a hell of a headache because <laughs> we've been opening with Inner Sandman for most of the tour for the last couple nights. As you can see, we've uh, moved Sandman down till the end. Why do you always use the good, the bad, and the ugly as your intro tape, and who came up with the idea? Uh, that credit goes to uh, Johnny Z. Johnny Zazula is his name. He was our first manager, and uh, why do we always use that? It's a good question. I'm not sure I have the answer to that. It just, you know, we started doing that in like 83, and it just it felt right, and um, it's pretty much been there ever since. Um, it's funny because somebody else asked me about that the other day, and I ans answered that maybe it would go into retirement after this tour. I don't know why I said that, but I did. <laughs> but um, it's just, it's really moody, and it's uh, very ep epic -y. Yeah, and uh, it just it felt right, so there it is. It signals that we're on our merry way. And it's showtime right now. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, pretty good, uh, but I have to go somewhere right now. Bye. Dude. Good luck in Europe, and thanks very much to Kirk for talking to us. James is walking into the arena, and there's <laughs> Jason going crazy. And uh, I hope James is feeling a little bit better because he wasn't very well. And there goes Lars. Bye, Lars!